John was born on the 12th of August 1947. He grew up in a suburb of Birmingham called Erdington. He lived in a small house in Perry Common Road. I think from a very early age, John fell in love with show business and entertainment. Every Christmas, his father, Sam, would take him to one of the local pantomimes, and the kind of the glitter and the fun of that, I think, seeped into John's DNA. John loved panto very much. We always used to go. It was uh, an annual thing every year at the Alexandra Theatre. His surroundings were not full of glamour and glitz, and I think he kind of yearned for that, he craved for that. He used to write off to Hollywood studios to get and collect autographs, and so he had a huge autograph collection of famous faces, the stars that he loved. And so he was a fan. He knew what it was to be a fan. We went to King Edward's Grammar School, Aston. You had to pass 11 plus to get to it. And we both felt like fish out of water, I think, when we first went there. It was quite daunting. It was a, a Victorian building, and there were the big portraits of the old masters around the walls, and we both thought that we were into something that may be a little bit beyond us. John's nickname for me at the time was Hawksford the Porksford, while he was Turner the Bunsen Burner. John wanted to be a performer, it was pretty obvious early on. He used to imitate masters at school and he loved people like Frankie Howard and used to do the voices from the Goon Show and uh, he just liked to kind of show off in front of people. And there's an instance when he w we were talking about, can you make yourself faint? And John said, yes, you can, this is how you do it. And he crouched on the desk puffed and blew for about, and sucked in air for about half a minute, and then blew as hard as he could on his thumb, and he just toppled forward off the desk, landed on his forehead, seemed to stand there for a, a minute before he collapsed onto the floor. Woke up about a minute and said, how did I do? John and I weren't the most sporty of people, and what we found was that we could entertain. So it was inevitable that when the review started at school, uh, older boys asked us if we would get involved, and I did the music side, and John was in the sketches. On stage, he was very much larger than life, and very much a bigger figure than many of the boys who were his contemporaries, who, who, who didn't have that flamboyance. I think flamboyant is the word I would coin for him, even when he was in his mid-teens. Parents used to talk about him as being the star performer, and he got good reviews in the school magazine. He persuaded the school to allow him to stage the first ever school pantomime, which he wrote and produced, Cinder's Fella, it was called. Which involved not only people like myself, but other boys who'd never done any performing before and he managed to put them on stage, these galumphing sportsmen, and of course the results were quite hilarious. John had boundless enthusiasm. He threw himself into everything and worked flat out on every aspect of, as it were, school show business. He was always right up there in terms of uh, being the person who was most likely to go into entertainment. When we were about 16, we, it was before we were supposed to drink, but of course we used to uh, steal some of our parents' drink. And once or twice, uh, John would fall asleep. He was noted for falling asleep by about 10 o'clock. And we all went upstairs to my parents' bedroom, and there was John tucked up in bed, uh, snoring away like a trooper. There was a critical moment for John at the end of his school life when he got his A-level results and they weren't quite as good as he'd wanted. I was offered a place at Hull, but to read drama and theology, the latter being a subject in which I really wasn't very interested at all. So after much thought, I turned it down and started looking for work in the theatre which was a massive decision and one that his parents were not very happy about. But he realised that to go and spend three years at university doing a subject he wasn't very interested in was probably going to be wrong for him and that he thought, actually, no, I'm going to start my life in the professional theatre as an actor. 
John was actually christened John Turner, very simple name, but as time went on, he had to change that because uh, there was another John Turner in Actors' Equity, and John, when he wanted to be an actor, would have had to be known by a different name. So he just fiddled around with it and turned it into John Nathan Turner. John's first big break was at the Alexandra Theatre on his doorstep in Birmingham and he got the job as what's called an acting ASM, or assistant stage manager, so you do small parts but you also work on the production of each play. The Alexandra got a lot of tours, a lot of number one tours and they did their own pantomimes and for John it was jumping in, you know, at the deep end with celebrities and I think Des O'Connor worked there, didn't he? For, well, everybody worked there at some point or another. The atmosphere of theatre life would have really appealed to him. And also, he would have been completely free to be himself in that environment because there was no sense that you had to be kind of wearing a suit and tie. I first met John when I was 18, and he would have been 19. I was working in a pub in Birmingham called The Vic, which was next door to the Alex. And in the evening, after the curtain came down, the cast and the stage management would come in for a drink. This sort of vibrant bundle of energy, John burst into the pub and they ordered drinks and we chatted for a bit and had a bit of camp banter and what have you. And he said, do you get a lot of tips? And I said, well, I get the odd tip, but, you know, not a lot. He said, if you put one of everything on the bottom shelf, because you always wear a short skirt, I think your tips will go up. And they did. <laughs> you always get the sense that John was completely comfortable within his own skin. He never seemed to exhibit the angst around his sexuality that a lot of other men in that era would have gone through. I knew from the off that John was gay. I mean, we never discussed it, but I just knew. It was, it was just John. <laughs> you could buy scrumpy cider then for about tuppence. We'd sit on the side of the canal and drink and talk about what we were going to do when I left drama school and he was going to move on from the Alex. He'd show me things that he'd written when he was at school. He wrote a lot of reviews and he used to like writing parodies of songs. And I'd talk quite stupidly about how I was going to be a great dramatic actress, which of course was madness, but there you go. We'd talk about, he loved performing, he loved singing, and he loved, he loved being in the limelight. It just seemed like I don't know, everything was possible at that point. You know, we were young, we just thought, oh, we can go to London, take it by storm. Everything was sort of there ahead of us. It was, it was just a lovely time. <laughs> <laughs>